little squirrel friend. How you doing? Oh, there's a second one of you. A third. Uh-oh. Yeah! Hello friendos, this is Chain, welcoming you back to Chain of Commander, and now that Modern Horizons 2 is out, I think it's time for my setly tradition of taking a gander at all the new commons we have available for us to kind of guess which ones will have the biggest splash in our format. Now before we get into this list, two quick points for you. First, if any of these cards seem like something you personally want to try building with, definitely consider using that TCG Player affiliate link in the description below. It won't cost you a single cent more, but it will help out the channel. And second, as with all the top lists on my channel, this is completely subjective, which means it's entirely based on my opinion, and you may not completely agree with it, and that is completely fine. If by the end of this list you feel that I may have omitted something, or I may have misjudged something, definitely sound off in the comments below. Your opinion is just as valid as mine. I just happen to put mine in a video on the internet. Those two things out of the way. Let's get into this list here, starting at where all pristine top lists start. At number six. All right, coming in at number six, just barely missing our top five, we have Sinister Starfish. Sinister Starfish is one in the black for a zero three creature starfish with an activated ability of tap, surveil one. This starfish is evil. It is no secret, I am a huge fan of the Surveil mechanic. In fact, about a month ago, I did a video on my top five favorite Surveil cards in EDH. Now, if this Starfish was available at the time of that video, I'll be honest, it probably wouldn't have made that top five either, but that doesn't mean I don't like it. I do like it, we're talking about it right now. Sinister Starfish is a design callback to the previously released Sigiled Starfish, which was the same thing, except it was blue, and instead of surveilling, it scried one in its stead. Both of these were nice, low-costed creatures you could get out early in the game to help set up your draws, but because Sinister Starfish surveils, it has the added bonus of also filling your graveyard. And it is a keyworded surveil. It isn't just a surveil type effect, which means it still gets away with triggering anything that cares about surveil. So things like Blood Operative, Whispering Snitch, Disinformation Campaign, all of these will trigger with the Sinister Starfish. And Sinister Starfish is a repeatable surveil effect, giving you the ability to surveil once per turn if you don't have a way to also untap it outside of its normal untap step. And because it's surveil, it has the ability to put cards from your library into your graveyard. So certain cards that look for you to be milling yourself. Things like Sidisi Brood Tyrant likes to see creatures get milled. Devourer of Memory, it just likes to see things get milled in general for you. And uh, Pedantic Learning, this is the one that if you mill yourself with land, you can pay to draw a card. This plays very nicely with all of those. It is just an all around great way to help smooth up your draws, as well as play well with other graveyard synergies you may be working with. Our next card is cracking top fives, like it's cracking walnuts, and that is Chatterstorm. Chatterstorm is one in the green for a sorcery. Create a 1-1 one, one green squirrel creature token, and Chatterstorm has Storm. It is raining squirrels, hallelujah. Storm is one of my all-time favorite mechanics, kind of like Surveil. For those of you at home that don't know what Storm does, Storm essentially says that whenever you cast a spell with Storm, copy it for each spell cast prior to it that turn. So if three spells were cast amongst you and your opponents prior to you casting the storm spell that turn, you get the storm spell plus three additional copies. In Modern Horizons 2, they noted that the mechanic was going to be moving away from Grixis, where it originally was. Quite often, all, I, all the cards were either green, black, or red, were all the storm cards prior to Modern Horizons 2. And it's going to move from that home on Grixis to its new shindig on Gruul Street. Previously, the only green storm card we had before this set was Weather the Storm, which was released in the prior Modern Horizons set. But with Modern Horizons 2, they've introduced three more green storm spells for us. But the only one 
the only one that qualifies for this list by being common is Chatterstorm. Essentially, it is a half-sized Empty the Warrens. Empty the Warrens would cost three and a red to make two 1-1 one, one Goblin Tokens, and that had Storm. So for half the cost, at only one in the green, you get half the power and toughness with only one token. But you are now in a color that cares more about tokens. Possibly the most caring about tokens color there is. White might care about them a bit more. But now having a storm card that can produce tokens in that color opens up the ability of using storm as a token creation engine without requiring you to introduce other colors into the deck. At number four, we have Goblin Anarchomancer. Goblin Anarchomancer is red and a green for a 2-2 creature Goblin Shaman. Each spell you cast that's red or green costs one generic less to cast. He is a master of mobocracy magic. As I just noted, Storm is moving from Grixis colors to Gruul colors. So not only were we given some good red-green payoffs for Storm, we were given some excellent enablers as well. And Goblin and Archimancer could very well be the best of them. It gives all your red, green, or both spells a static one mana reduction. And in my opinion, I feel like mana reducers are often overlooked as excellent, possibly the best mana dorks out there because they can represent significantly more mana over the course of a turn than a regular mana dork could. As soon as you cast your second spell off Goblin Anarchomancer, you have already exceeded the amount of mana an Elvish Mystic can do. As soon as you cast three or four spells off of it within a turn, you have just blown away in pure value. My initial thoughts of this card, and I think a lot of people did this as well, is they compared it to Goblin Electromancer, that is the uh, red-blue one that makes all your instants and sorcery spells cheaper, but I think we might have been mistaken with that. I remember how I said earlier, we're moving from Grixis to Gruul with the Storm. It, it, the same thing is happening here, because this is much more similar to Nightscape Familiar, a black creature that makes all your red and blue spells cheaper. Now it's just a Gruul creature making all of your Gruul spells cheaper. Granted, red-green often doesn't really need help in the ramp department, but if you are planning on taking advantage of these new storm mechanics in these colors, then this is definitely a little shaman you're gonna wanna take a gander at. How have you guys been liking the list so far? You been enjoying this? If so, if by the end of it you would like it, definitely hit that like button right there in the corner. I'd love to see that. But that said, we got three more to go, so let's go jump on into them. For our number three card, we have Late to Dinner. Late to Dinner is three and a white for sorcery. Return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Create a food token. Friendship lasts forever. At least for these pachyderms. Late to Dinner is the most recent in a line of four mana value white reanimation spells following the line of Breath of Life, False Defeat, Resurrection, Refurbish, kinda. Essentially, it is a strictly better version of Breath to Life and False Defeat. Uh, side note on False Defeat. That card is like $25 now. Late to dinner is going to be like not even 25 cents. Value. But Late to dinner does not just bring a creature back like all those previously mentioned ones. It also gives you a food token, which opens up the possibility of some food-based synergies. And with a lot of other food support in Modern Horizons 2... That gives you a lot of toys that you can start playing with. We are now hitting the point where the available amount of white reanimation spells at our disposal, um, they're reaching a critical mass that we can now open up reanimation strategies and color combinations that you might not frequently see them in. In fact, I am currently in the process of turning my Plargusta deck into an Osgir Boros reanimator deck. Because who needs black anymore? We have everything we need right here. At our number two spot, we have my favorite two drop from the set, Ornithopter of Paradise. Ornithopter of Paradise is two generic mana for an O2 artifact creature Thopter. It has flying and is tap. 
add one mana of any color. This is the magic card Jimmy Buffett would sing about if Jimmy Buffett was singing about magic cards. It is a mana efficient mana dork that can produce any color. In fact, this is the cheapest non-green mana dork that can net produce any color. Previously, it was Alloy Mirror at three generic mana. And since it is colorless, it can go into any deck. Uh, fun story about this one. It's also a strict upgrade to Utopia Tree, which was one in a green to produce one mana of any color. And that was considered a rare back in the Invasion set. So, power creep is real, folks. When it comes to mana rocks, the general baseline I like to consider is that you want your mana rocks to get at least half the mana back that they cost. Take a look at Arcane Signet. It costs two mana, it produces one mana when it hits the field. However, Ornithopter of Paradise, while it looks like it meet, meet those requirements, it is a creature, so it is afflicted by summoning sickness, which means you probably aren't going to be able to use it the turn it comes out. Because of that, I now have to compare these to the diamonds, the edge of the battlefield tapped mana rocks that can only produce one color. If you are playing a deck with multiple colors and the diamonds, Ornithopter Paradise might be able to slide right in just because it can produce any color. I think the diamonds are playable in certain aspects. I know Ornithopter Paradise will be playable in many. Now before we get to my uh, favorite comment from this set for EDH, I do have to quickly mention one honorable mention, and that would be the bridge cycle. The enter the battlefield tapped indestructible artifact lands, one for each color pairing that came out in Modern Horizons 2. If you caught my video last week, then you have already heard pretty much everything I have to say about these lands and why I like them. So if you haven't caught that video, I definitely recommend heading over that way once this video is wrapped up to check out all the cool ways we could take advantage of these new artifact lands. Also, before we get into the number one here, if you've been enjoying this list so far, definitely consider subscribing. I'd love to have you folks join us going forward just for just deck techs, top five, I guess top six in this case list, just general chit chat on the commander format. I'd love to have you folks hanging out with us going forward. That said, let's finally get to our number one choice here. All right, coming in at number one, my favorite new common out of Modern Horizons 2 for EDH, we have Bannerhide Krushak? Bannerhide Krushak, three and a green for a four, four creature beast with trample. It has reinforced two for one and a green and scavenge for five green, green. Really? Bannerhide Krushak. This card was not a part of any official spoiler. It wasn't revealed until the full spoiler at the end of spoiler week. It never received any fanfare, limited attention, nobody really talked about it. But now it's time I give this thing the attention it may or may not truly deserve. The reason why I love this card is because the value never seems to stop with it. First, let's do the vanilla test. It's a 4-4 for 4, 4, 4. Great, French vanilla test. It's a 4-4 for 4, 4, 4 with trample, already above rate. When it's in your hand, it also has the Reinforce 2 ability. So for one and a green, you can discard this card to put two plus one plus one counters on target creature. This ability can be activated at instant speed. So it can also be used as a combat trick. And once it's in the graveyard, then it also has the ability to scavenge, which is a sorcery speed ability where you pay five green green to exile this from the graveyard. And then you can put four additional plus one plus one counters on a creature. Both of these abilities play super well with any decks that care about having plus one plus one counters on creatures. While it itself doesn't have a way to give itself plus one plus one counters, it is more than ready to share the love and share the strength of some plus one plus one counters on other creatures you control. And the great thing is you can use it once and then you can use it again because of that scavenge ability. It's just the value never seems to stop with this card. And I truly think this is going to be the ultimate sleeper because once it finds some decks that it really plays nicely in, it is going to be an all-star that outperforms any expectations of what you might be expecting for it in your deck. All right, at this point, I wanna hear from you folks. Like I said, your opinions are probably different. 
Let me know what you think in the comments below, whether you like the cards I put on my list, if you think they're garbage, definitely just give me the heads up. I'd love to talk about it. Beyond that, thank you very much for joining me today. I love it when we get to hang out like this, and I'll see you guys again in the future.